Welcome to the Scandinavian Mind podcast, our weekly show about how technology is changing the creative industries. Today on the program, how cross-industry collaboration can help save fashion. We are revisiting a talk from Transformation Conference in Helsinki back in May of this year, where we gathered investors, innovation companies and fashion brands in just that, a cross-industry conversation about the fashion industry's most pressing issues. In this talk, we'll hear from Jessica Rameau, partner at the VC company Wellstreet, Elin Silvas, production manager and sustainability lead at Brixtel Textiles, Ulli Kekkonen, founder of the Bi- Nordic Bioproducts Group, and Thomas Håkansson, a designer for brands such as Tiger of Sweden, Fjällräven and Swims. This is one of my favorite parts about doing the Transformation Conference, is getting people from different industries to come together. And it's also one of the most positive feedbacks we get from the event. The fact that we get people, designers from fashion brands, entrepreneurs running fashion brands, investors that are investing in fashion industry and innovation companies and other organizations that are building a new kind of supply chain. That these people are all coming together under one event, one umbrella to discuss this, which actually is very, very rare right now. And, but I do think we need much more of this, and that's why I'm so proud of producing the Transformation Conference. So in this talk, we discuss the need for understanding the whole supply chain and the end of life of the product, the importance and challenges of becoming a profitable brand while making progress on sustainability, and what these different industries can learn from each other. My name is Konrad Olsson. I'm editor-in-chief and founder of Scandinavian Mind, And this is the sixth season of the Scandinavian Mind podcast. Before we go in, just a reminder that all talks from the Helsinki conference are now uh, available to view on demand on our website. Uh, Just go to ScandinavianMind.com and you'll find the link in our news section. And of course, don't miss the upcoming Stockholm edition of Transformation Conference taking place during Nordic Fabric Fair at Stockholm Fashion District on August 31st. Visit ScandinavianMind.com slash transconf to sign up and get your tickets. It's free of charge. It's an excellent opportunity to meet people from, as I said, fashion brands, investors, innovation companies and startups to come together to discuss a new fashion future. Here now, my conversation with Jessica Ramo, Elin Silvast, Oli Kekkonen and Thomas Håkansson. Enjoy. Uh, uh, Jessica, I would just uh, I want to follow up with a couple of questions. I mean, you have um, in your portfolio fashion brands uh, yeah. in this sector, and I, I really liked the, the part where you talked about going in early and talking about this stuff, not postponing it, not like starting a business and like, okay, sustainability, we'll deal with it later uh, when we have time or money. Uh, uh, can you talk about how this is, you know, how do you do this and how is this received from your companies? Are they welcoming this? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that, that was probably one of, our, one of our biggest surprises when we, we built the whole framework. I thought, okay, I'm going to need to sell this to the companies. You know, are they going to understand that this is really important for their future and also their financial future? But actually, they were, they were really ready for it. Um, and if anything, wanted help, I think, and support to sort of understand the whole context, which is why we sort of really tried to simplify and narrow it down. Um, But essentially, I think entrepreneurs of today understand and I think want to build businesses that are going to stand the test of time and without having sustainability at the core, businesses won't stand the test of time. Um, Essentially, what we do have, though, is especially on the the fashion brand side, we have a lot of entrepreneurs who are very focused on... um, the sustainability aspects of the clothes that they produce mm. um, but but it's hard sometimes for them to understand that they need to do sort of all of the backbone across the business not just okay choosing the right fiber having a code of conduct for their supplier but actually it needs to run across the whole business whether it's their board whether it's their hiring practices whether it's the design process um, as a company they need to cover all of those things not just the production process um, so that's the part where it's like okay yes you're fantastic in that area but we need to make sure that you have a holistic approach to sustainability as the impact you have as a business not just as a brand and the clothes that that you put out Mm. 
I brought you guys on uh, to me as a moderator, perhaps the most challenging panel today, because you all represent different parts of the industry. And but that's kind of the whole point here. We want to talk about how to uh, collaborate across industries. Um, uh, Eileen and Thomas, you represent uh, the, the fashion side, and I want to start there with you, Eileen. You, uh, as with your work with Brixton Textiles, can you give a sense of the work that you do and and kind of the the, the opportunities and challenges with 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 your ambition of being as, as sustainable fashion brand as you can be? Can you talk about the, the work that you, you give us an intro? Absolutely. Um, well, we've been working with sustainability um, for the last seven years. That's when we started to, to make the transformation, so to speak. And just like you said, Jessica, we have been focusing on the products and the production, uh, code of conduct, um, choosing the right materials and fibers and evolving step by step. Since we are a pretty small business with limited resources in not only funds, but also in manpower and time, we could only take it uh, small steps at a time. Um, but starting, we needed to start somewhere, so that's where we started. And over these years, we've been growing and growing and growing, and this upcoming collection that comes out um, this autumn, um, we have, 85% of the collection made from sustainably sourced materials, um, which, is, which is a great milestone for mm -hmm. us. But as you said, Jessica, we really need to get a bigger scope of the, um, of the business in total. And that's where we find ourselves being limited by our own resources. Mm. Uh, how we're going to find the time and money to get all of this other information and make that transformation um, when there's so few of us. Um, and yeah, I would say that that's, that's where we are right now. You mentioned sourcing of textiles is always a big, big part of, of, of your job. Uh, can you let us inside the, the kind of day-to-day -day business of finding and sourcing materials, uh, finding factories, how do you assess uh, uh, the suppliers that you, that you use? Um, well, we do, we've been working with many different uh, fabric mills, fabric suppliers, fabric or material agents for many years, so we have a long relationship with them and they know us as a brand. So connecting with them and they will know exactly what our demands are in terms of sustainability, but also durability, mm. because Br Brickstall Textiles is an outerwear brand in majority. Um, so in that case, that helps us a lot, long-term relationships, but um, looking at new types of fibers um, that is a bit more tricky due to the high MOQs, the minimum quantities that we mm. can place an order of, especially if you look outside of the EU, there are the, the minimums are really, really high. And if to get a lower minimum, we have to raise the price, <coughs> which will affect the end price for our end customers. And yeah, you can see the difficulties with that. Um, but we also, to source new fibers, we also talk amongst our colleagues in the industry. Um, and we take part in initiatives and the groups and workshops. Most recently, there's an um, initiative called the Nordic Textile Collaboration, which is uh, the environmental departments from Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. And we're all talking together from different sides of different industries, which is very interesting and hopefully will lead to more transparency and exchange of information and knowledge, I would say. Very interesting. I want to circle back to that. But I want to bring you in, uh, Thomas. As uh, you know, you have uh, long experience working as a designer and creative director with, with some of the leading brands in the Nordics. And uh, I'll let you introduce what, what brands you have worked with. Um, from a kind of designer's perspective and, and sourcing new innovations, what does your process look like? What, what, what are you looking for when, you, when you're looking for new innovative materials? 
Is this working? It's working. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yes, I have been around since uh, before the Berlin Wall was still existing. <laughs> so I'm still around, <laughs> sort of. Uh, no, but in fact, I have the privilege to work with a lot of Scandinavian brands, the major one, everything from Marco Polo, Dobber, Tiger Sweden, Peak Performance, Fiat mm. Leven, Oscar Jacobs, and a lot of these brands. And I run my own brand in the 90s as well. In fact, I've had Erja Hekkinen as an agent here. You maybe knew her, but Mika Hekkinen's yeah. wife, okay, in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but the, things, the, the thing I look into, and especially within the Phoenix Group, who was has working a lot with sustainability, like, and I consider it from a designer's perspective, we need to understand the whole process. I mean, for, for me, it's the yarn. It's like, I mean, I compare something to the food industry. We see uh, fashionable chefs out there, and they claim they want to buy the chicken from parts of France. I can agree with that. I'm foodie as well. I started this business as size 46, and I'm 52 now. So <laughs> you see what he's adding. But I like the idea to understand the complexity. Mm. And the problem is the supply chain, as you say, is that everybody say they put, push it forward. The brand expect the fabric supplier to be sustainable, but keep the price level. Mm. Yeah. And the fabric guys go to the yarn supplier. Yeah, I need a certification. I need everything, but I can't pay more than I do today. And that creates a very odd situation, I would say. The problem is that we are blind. I mean, we still have an idea of volume dri drives profit, like T4 back in the days when they do a lot of, and I think we need to evaluate that because we can see as Mao represented earlier, all the leftover, the, the way of no, I think the design process need to be more precise, more evaluated. And we need to understand long perspective in the supply chain. We know the problem with yarn, minimums, etc. But let's not talk about next season. Let's talk about four or five years from now uh, to see. And it may look as a limitation, but I love the idea of using creativity. I mean, we are still in the creative way. So by, I can give an example. I did a project now for American brand. Unfortunately, I can't say it because it's still under the radar. But the idea was that post-COVID, how can we do something efficient sustainable, that is scalable as well. Because that is, of course, I love the idea of initiative on a certain level, but it has to matter on the bigger level, need to scale. And one thing we can do, for example, is limit the number of fabrics we're using in collection. For example, I used one fabric for an overshirt in wool, well, and I decided to use the same fabric as lining in another jacket. And a buyer will say, no, no, no Thomas, it's too expensive lining fabric, this one. We can't have that lining in that. We don't need that. Yes, but on the other hand, we, by using the same fabric for different products, according to functionality, we maybe avoid the MOQ, which means that we have less to monitoring, and we can have that fabric overseas, and so we can see it could be lining next season as well. That is just an example of, because I think, and that is a criticism to our business ourselves, I think we have to be open-minded about, especially from the creative side, I feel that as a designer, you need to understand the whole picture. What is we really doing here? And what certain kind of products may, should have, we have a very, very good way of measuring sustainability nowadays mm. without talking about certification and new rules. The lifespan of the product. Mm. Because, I mean, to be able to replace a zipper on a jacket, it takes just a little bit more effort. And I'm the generation of designers that they were sending out to the factories. Nowadays, it's more behind the screen. It's charming in a way, but I see a problem here. Because by communicating with the manufacturer, they know what to do. Can we change that seam instead? We can make, earn some euros by maybe not overlooking that, but it's still technical R&D process. And I think a lot of brands push less attention because they're also pushing the suppliers, say, we pay that, and if you don't, that we change. So next season will be another. So I think I talked too long now, but anyway, I'm no. so excited. The thing is that we need to have a longer perspective within the business. I think that, and collaborate. I love that you say, and not really isolate. It's the same with the distribution. If it's e-com or retail, it has to be idea of producing more garment in a longer lifespan with higher creative mindset, mm. we'll still have the same profit. I, I know that we, when designers start to talk about figures, you should be worried. But I learn it, I know it for sure, because it makes a difference. 
I need to take some water now. Take some water. Take a break. I'll, I'll come back to you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, only I want to bring you your perspective in. You are a um, wonderful new innovations company based out of, of, of Finland here. Uh, we actually have an interview with Oli in the issue of Scandinavian Mind that some of you may have taken a, a copy of. Um, I know you're in this sort of R&D phase of where you are. Maybe we need to explain what you do a little bit in terms of providing uh, fibers and textiles. And, and maybe start there and I'm going to ask you about how you're connecting with the fashion industry. Yes, as a, uh, being an innovation company for technologies and biomaterials, so one of the, the, let's say the biggest industries at the moment that kind of way are in trouble is of course textile industry and, and as we are talking today and we have heard a lot of good you know speeches about the, the transformation that is um, ahead of us huge I think it's a huge topic it's great that we are talking about here we also one enable a, a solution provider try to find a solution for also here the textile industry to in to, to improve the sustainability in the value chain and the production value chain by creating a technology solution, material solutions, that, that the whole value chain would be more sustainable. Uh, one of our, our technologies is, uh, is, is AltoCell technology, it happens to be maybe one of the most promising uh, technology to, to reprocess uh, and recycle chemically the very, very tough of polycotton waste, for example, and, and, and because of this, there's a, quite a huge interest at the moment uh, among uh, textile industry brands, fashion industry brands, towards us as well. That you know, and seems that everyone wants to have a solution. Wants to, they, everyone understands there's a need for change, but there's a very little, very little solutions yet. And what my colleagues here just explained, I also I understand totally the, the, the challenges that you have with the, the whole value chain. Uh, you know, that consumers do not necessarily want to pay any more for the sustainable clothing. Industry doesn't want to pay. They say nothing, you know, no more, but still they want to have more sustainable solutions. And it just doesn't match. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry. Um, how do you interact with the fashion industry? Are, are you at that phase now or, or foresee that you will interact with the fashion industry? I'm curious about, uh, because you will play a part in, in the value chain and that's your ambition of, of your innovation. Yeah, we are interacting with them, yeah, with, uh, with a lot of, I would say they almost all hmm. there as well, because we are not too many. We're luckily here in Finland, a strange situation that the small country here in, in, in North, that, and we have the you know, biggest number of the novel innovations when it comes to the, the, the man-made cellulosic fibers and, and spin-nova kind of fibers. But, so what we're interacting with them, that there's a huge interest, but there's a barrier. At the moment, no one knows who's going to pay for the chains. Who's going to be in charge of that one? That it's really the whole value chain becomes as say, sustainable. There are not technology solutions. No one is providing yet real industrial scale solutions for for sustainable textile fibers. There are nice tries. We are one of them, coming a bit, you know, behind others. But uh, this is the situation at the moment. We are keen on to give the solution. We have the knowledge, the understanding how to actually make it, but it will need efforts, money, someone's support. Whoever wants to have that solution would need to stand out yeah. and say, okay, Well, we speaking are. about money, we have an investor here. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, let's great pivot into what you talked about, Jessica, with um, kind of the, the power of um, what's happening in the in, in investment space in terms of putting sustainability requirements on the investments. Mm -hmm. Could that be a driver for what's happening here? We see fashion brands want to do better, we see innovation and in companies want to service the fashion industry, but it will uh, it require costs, so to speak, to develop these things. Um. Yes, um, although I think, like, I think one of the key challenges, and like to touch upon what, what you were speaking about, at the end of the day, from an investment perspective, we're looking for solutions that actually have or have the potential to have commercial traction within mm. the, the sort of short, 
short to medium to long term, depending on the investor, right? But I mean, we made some investments in the circular economy space then, or you know, reuse, recycle back in 2016, and it felt like okay, we're a little bit ahead, but this is coming, and we're in 2023, and it's not really come, uh, you know. So at the end of the day, I think what we want to see actually is the industry and the brands jumping on board and like starting to use some of the solutions that like some fantastic entrepreneurs are putting out on the market, but at some point they run out of time and they run out of money and investors can't keep reinvesting unless they're actually sort of experiencing that commercial traction. Um, and so it's fantastic to see, you know, some of the larger brands, they have so many innovation labs and initiatives and they have all these projects in their sustainability report, but the question is scale. And like, at what point can they take things to scale? Um, and I think at the same time, there needs to be a fundamental shift in how they think about business models. And I love what you said about the, the life cycle of the product and how it can be reused and recycled. And so, so the brands also need to adapt how they think about the return on a product on that time scale as well. At the moment, they put something on the shelf, they get paid for it. And everything that happens after, after that, they are giving away essentially to sort of the, the secondhand market. Now, if they start to think about how much they invest in a product over the life cycle of that product and actually understand, okay, what is the revenue potential of an item if it's circulated one, two, three times or recycled in different ways, then the business case is actually there, but they need to change the timeline and the horizon mm. um, for, for how they look at that, at that garment. And that's like another shift that needs to happen also, not just on, on the products itself, but on uh, sort of the expectations from a business case perspective. Ian, I know, as you mentioned, Brickstall is, uh, like many brands uh, active in, in the Nordic market, sort of the small to medium sized brands um, growing organically. I don't think you've taken in major funding. Do, do you think that will be inevitable? I don't want you to disclose anything you can't, but at some point to, to take further steps, so to speak, uh, to in this in direction. Investors, yes. To don't do it. <laughs> Well, um, I have to say my, um, uh, the management and the owners of Brickstall Textiles are very transparent with their staff. Mm. Um, so we discuss everything from, from this to what paper we're going to have, you know, everything. So, um, and right now, um, we're still not interested really in taking in investors because Many of the times when a fashion brand takes in investors, they lose control of the final product because then the investors, with all their rights, uh, put a demand on the brand and to increase the margins, to increase the profits, mm. and it has to go fast. This could affect, especially a smaller brand like we are, um, because the leverage that we have towards our suppliers isn't as heavy as it is for the bigger companies. So it takes time for us. We take it step by step because, as I said, we're an outerwear brand as well. So the durability of the fabrics, our products are made to last season over season. We are not really that trendy in that way because we want them to be timeless and we want them to have a long lifespan. So, and using recycled fibers, most of the time, they're not as durable. They're coming there, but still not as durable as conventional polyester, conventional cotton, or virgin wool, because the fibers are shorter. Um, so in this sense, we cannot stress the, the products and the mm. profits. Uh, so I think that's one of the main reasons why we haven't uh, brought in any investors. Uh, but Thomas, from, from the perspective of being a designer, how, how much power do you feel like you have? Because it feels like you are, in a way, uh, closest to the garments. You're closest to creating these innovations, sourcing uh, newer materials, better materials, so to speak. But then you have to motivate the, the cost of each, uh, uh, each uh, sort of piece of the garment. Um, you know, not to, you, know, you can mention names if you want to, but, but from abroad, you've worked with so many different brands. Uh, what's the kind of level of, of power that you feel like you have? I wish it was higher, <laughs> but I'm still in York. But in fact, of course, it's, I, I take it seriously and I think it's important. Sorry. Watch. <laughs> Uh, anything, uh, it's that I, I believe it's, it's important from a brand, even if, I mean, I'm working with fashion brands and outdoor brands, and they have different perspectives. Mm. Uh, Fjellreven, if they need a new product, they have a design brief, 
we start the product development two years before it actually meets with testing, evaluating. But in a fashion context, it's more of a look, a color, a silhouette, shorter time. And, but in the end of the day, it's about, I believe as a designer, you need, I mean, we talk about the fabric, the supply, everything. But another thing no one talks much about, how do we really, all the things we manufacture without really knowing, the leftovers in the stock, or wherever it is, go to a factory nowadays to see, they can show you a lot of colors, less commercial, that someone ordered and hopefully should be sellable. So, I mean, there are ways of what we actually use and, and also have evaluate. And I think it's interesting in the creative process. That's what I want to highlight. Besides, I see it as industrial aspect of sustainability. And that is logistically planning, etc. And then it's a creative part. I mean, compared to the music industry, for example, back in the days before Spotify, there was a band playing guitar. Hopefully, he could write a song or her. And they went to studio, release a record, tour. Then there came the revolution in music with the DJs come and they come doing the all kind of mixes and they become bigger than the actual artist. And I think nowadays we have stylist influencers and I can see a lot of interesting collaborations there with bring in them into the brand and the brand has to be more open-minded maybe uh, and to see to together make the impact to the consumer and make the appetite to consume. I think in that way we can declare the relevance for sustainability, and maybe not, and that uh, <coughs> makes me a little bit sad sometimes, that we apply a way of guilt in feeling of consuming. Because, I mean, we like to do that. And mm. I can tell you from working in the menswear shop where I started back in the days, I, have, I can prove that I know it, it works. The vanity, the idea of seeing a young man coming in or whatever it is in the shop and feeling insecure, either his wife girlfriend or whatever pushed him there and then makes him feel like okay I'm maybe get light tonight going home and see that <laughs> then we can add in something and I think that by using this creativity and also I can imagine from a brand perspective that let's say that you create a collection and we commit ourselves in three seasons from now yeah. we will come back in some way we'll be pimping up that garment with you mm. let's say do something with the either with the collaboration influence so I mean there are ways and I think a lot of brands and not even brands within the supply chain we hold the cards very close to the body no one's what to show what to do you should I said at the initiative you talk about maybe share I mean I've been working for some years with the, the, uh, the dupe dye solution dye technology which I worked with back in the days which means less water use and they have a fantastic color fastness and okay, fantastic one problem is that it's high MQ, even if it proves it. But by, for example, replacing black lining in, in some of the big brands, just replacing the black lining, millions of meters can be done, mm -hmm. easy. But then something, oh, no way, yes, but we need this weight, we need this denier yarn count. Come on, it's not that many care about that. I mean, there are other things to do. So there has to be a way of being more pragmatic, make the difference where it's easy to make the difference, and use the creativity to communicate that and make it relevant. Yeah, that's super interesting. And, and you, know, you talked about that as well. And we've talked previously here on the panel, the need for, for more transparency in the fashion industry. It's, it feels like it's an industry that has a, a tradition of keeping everything close. We think it's so unique and, and, and everything is proprietary and so forth. Do you, do, you th do you think you need more collaboration between actual fashion brands, like on the same level? Uh, definitely. Uh, I, yeah, we talked about this yesterday. It's, uh, um, the fashion industry has always been so secretive and uh, classified. Um, and to some point, I, I understand that, of course. Uh, but today, um, it, if we're going to follow this new path, which we, with the EU is forcing us to do as well, which is a good thing, uh, we welcome this change. Um, but in order for us to, to reach that goal, we need to start collaborate. If it's placing fabric orders together to reach those high MOQs or, or sharing knowledge and information regarding, oh, this supplier is really dependable or, uh, or new collaborations with new fabric suppliers who can, uh, for instance, keep stock of fabrics, then we can reach the higher MOQs or 
uh, but also collaborations uh, with other industries to help us understand uh, what we can do together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think more transparency and I think we will see a lot more transparency really soon. We're working on it right now. Um, Too much you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I, I think another important perspective is that when we talk about raising prices and the, the challenge with the supply chain, I, can, I, I, I think, for example, we're talking about Europe now, and, uh, and, and uh, I'm doing a project now with two suppliers in Italy, Portugal, and the idea there is to start, I mean, if the good things with manufacturing in the EU is, is it's, it's a flexible volume, etc., and uh, on a high standard on sustainability, it's expensive, though. So that means competitive. But if you go to some of these companies, a lot of them are doing quite well now in Europe, even if they're struggling with the prices as well because power, etc., is much more expensive. But yes, by start to talk with that and say, if they, most of these factories around Europe are owned by families still, so they have looked, they've been around for a while, they have seen crisis before. So by just start to talking, what do they say? If, if they build the confidence, the idea of the, as a small brand, that you have an ID that you, you can declare it for, and say, we will do this together over season, a long-term collaborations built on trust, mm. that we do that. Then instead of going as a small brand to an investor, say, I want to start a fashion brand. Okay, I've heard about that before. And going, and a lot of expensive costs because that you're doing a lot of things and you're negotiating with different suppliers and someone have that one and you ended up in a, you don't know what to do, and in the end of the bottom line, you don't earn money, it's cost money. Because you are focusing on the product, the image, the concept, but less on the actual supply chain and how to do that. How can I integrate that in my brand culture as a designer? And of course, depending on where you, where you aim and if you want to be on high premium level, volume, whatever it is. But I think by doing that, building trust in the supply chain, because what they are afraid of, investing in things, startup doing a lot of things for one season and then the brand take the whole concept and do it in Asia. So they just invent things in the startup process and then mm. So I mean, there are a lot of things, again, when it comes to, I think it's in the, in the end of the day, it's less complicated than we do. But we need to really declare what is the problem, challenging part in the whole chain. And I don't believe it. I think the consumer can pay more I call it sustainable, it should be sustainable, but in the end of the day, the business model traditionally is, I don't think we can talk, I mean, something cost 100, cost the consumer pays seven, eight hundred, nine. I mean, if we should stretch that more, that's not the way to no. go. No. Uh, I think business model is a whole different uh, panel, we can't get into that. Yeah, <laughs> don't, don't think they can design into that one. Only, only I want to uh, end with you. Uh, when you move from this R&D phase and going into more uh, commercial product, what types of collaborations are you looking for uh, in the industry? What types of connections or and maybe what types of knowledge are you seeking from, from the fashion industry in order to, to succeed with your product? Well, it's a good question. Yeah, it's a whole value chain thinking about it that the, the end users and then the, the producers of the the raw material, everything in between. So, looking for to have a dialogue with first of all the uh, you know the technology providers as well, the ones that will enable uh, the, the scaling up the, the, the technologies that we eventually will will develop, and and then to understand also the whole holistic, uh, let's say view on what is really needed there, as we have discussed this as well, that it's really sustainable. But we are not, again, saying this, that we are not coming up with one solution and then creating a two or dozen new one uh, mm. uh, problems there. But this collaboration between designers, brands, investors, uh, technology providers, companies and so on, it, we just need more dialogues. We, Conrad, we need more this kind of a conference and this kind of things here. We need to open more this topic and, and, and I think involve the audience as well there as a consumers and, mm. and the players in the industry. We all need it to solve this problem. I think that's a great way to end this panel. Jessica, Elin, Oli and Thomas, a round of applause. Thank you so much.
You've been listening to the Scandinavian Mind podcast with me, Konrad Olsson. This show was edited by Erik Sedin. Don't forget to sign up to our newsletter not to miss out on any upcoming talks and events. Visit scandinavianmind.com newsletter. Until next week, goodbye. <laughs>